As founder and president of the Wellbeing Foundation Africa, Her Excellency Mrs. Toyin Siraki is a Nigerian leader, advocate, and philanthropist for maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health, as well as socioeconomic empowerment through the Foundation Africa and her global health advocacy. Mrs. Siraki has worked with a broad range of partners that include the UNFPA, UNHCR, Medela, Nutrition International, Johnson & Johnson, the Nigeria Federal Ministry of Health, and the organized private sector. Mrs. Siraki has demonstrated leadership over the last two decades on the advancement of women's health throughout communities around health workers and midwives. I am honored that this incredible advocate and philanthropist and Concordia Leadership Council member is here at this table with me today. Mrs. Siraki, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Matthew, and good morning. Good morning, good Thank morning. Thank you for having me. You are a constant presence during this week for the world. This unique, strange, traffic-filled week by which the majority of the world's heads of government descend upon New York for one week. And that can pose some challenges, but that can also pose some opportunities. What is it you're hoping to achieve this week? You know, this week for us at the Wellbeing Foundation and for myself personally, it's like a time check. You know, we came out of COVID and COVID was a very difficult time to keep frontline programming going. We were lucky because we operate through health workers. So they had that special status, much needed status to keep services going. But we're not living in an island. You know, what happens in one country has a domino effect on another country. So this particular anger, first of all, from Nigeria, I feel that we are at a now or never moment. We've had, um, this is probably a second or third chance to get our path to the SDGs right. But because of the cost of living crisis around the world, you know, mental health issues and general insecurity and conflict, I feel that I really had to come, first of all, to see what the rest of the world was doing, to hear their victories, learn about their challenges, and to begin to calibrate what I will be doing in my country based on evidence both from my country and from other countries. So this week is a listening week it's a sharing week, it's a collaborating week, but it's also a very strategic week for decision making. And very, um, quite a few significant decisions have actually been made this week, but we're all going to have to work very hard to actually meet the SDGs. Talking about the Sustainable Development Goals for a moment, a report was issued, uh, I believe it was in May, that did not really give a particularly flattering assessment of how far along we are towards the goal of achieving the SDGs. What is the, the one central challenge uh, now that we face to achieve them? I think the real challenge that we have in achieving the SDGs now is to actually achieve people-centered development. Insofar as development sits in a vacuum and wants to only work on statistics and doesn't actually take it right down to the primary front line, we will have difficulty. I, I don't see any point in talking about SDGs if the people that are going to move those SDGs don't know what they mean and don't know how to access them. So I'm actually really, really calling on world leaders to make sure that they're not just sitting here in an echo chamber, you know, saying the same words to each other again and again. We missed the MDGs and the SDGs, it's 2030, we're halfway there. Yes, you're seeing pockets of excellence in some places, like maternal mortality, for instance, has actually dropped by about 30%, but it hasn't dropped everywhere by 30%. We're seeing issues where, for instance, black and minority ethnicities are actually showing a rise in mortalities. So we have to take a rights-based approach to every single one of the Sustainable Development Goals, and we have to make sure that it actually cascades right down to every last man, woman, and child. Talk a bit about Wellbeing Foundation Africa. Talk a bit about its origins. Well, the Wellbeing Foundation Africa, I set it up in 2004 when I was actually First Lady of Kwara State, which is in North Central Nigeria. It was the reflection of what happened to me 
when I started to have children in my reproductive years, and then seeing years later as a first lady that what had happened to me, you know, having a stillbirth, having an emergency birth, not having the right tools around me, all I had was my knowledge. And actually my knowledge served me right because my knowledge saved my life because I knew what to ask for. But when I was a first lady, I suddenly started counting maternal deaths. And I thought, hang on a minute, nothing's changed in my country in 10, 15 years. And in fact, you know, I, what I, I think I'm looking at an emergency. So I spent about six months doing like a cricket tally, counting, and then I booked an appointment to go and see the then Minister of Health. And I said, well, this is what I'm noticing in the state that my husband governs. And I don't think this is an isolated case. Can we start counting together? And that's when we realized actually that Nigeria had the second highest maternal death preventable mortality in the world. And so since then, we've come a very long way. Um, first of all, I started with advocacy, but after a while, advocacy just wasn't enough. You know, you, you can't keep talking about things and not doing them. And so in the last five years, we've actually made very significant investments in frontline programming. We did a whole state programming in emergency obstetric and newborn care. And the state in which we did that program now has the highest survival in Nigeria. And it's actually had the highest survival in Nigeria ever since we did the program. I'm spreading out our work a lot. So we have a central flagship program, which is the Mama Care Antenatal and Postnatal Program. And that's run by an army of midwives who go to public and private hospitals and they give free antenatal and postnatal advice to mothers. It's the most amazing thing. And it's digitally backed as well. So we also have a digital midwife who runs WhatsApp groups so the mothers can stay in touch all the time. And I think we're actually reaching around 8,000 mothers every week in about nine states. And then we have become a frontline implementer of choice. So for instance, we implemented the low osmolarity zinc and SALTS program to reduce diarrhea in Sokoto and Kano states on behalf of Nutrition International. And that was very exciting for me because we had never worked that far north in Nigeria before in such high burden states. We've seen a reduction of over 30% in diarrheal related deaths, and we've seen a bigger reduction in diarrheal disease. So some of the things we're battling might sound prehistoric when I'm talking about them in New York, you know, to be investing millions of dollars in diarrhea. And we also work very um, deeply on breastfeeding. Most exciting for me on our breastfeeding programs, aside from the standard breastfeeding classes that we're giving to regular mums, we've extended our programming to neonatal intensive care units. So those are mothers who are really quite fragile because their children are very fragile in incubators and it can be very difficult to get lactation going. And so we have a wide range of programs. We have school-based programming as well for Hygiene Quest, where we are doing water sanitation and hygiene and also climate and the environment. But I believe that we now have um, a sort of balance in our programming because I have always felt that the word well-being isn't just health, it's health education and your socioeconomic power and so by equalizing the share of our programming between education and between health i think we are really beginning to bring our people towards attaining well-being i'd love to get a sense from you you're at concordia uh, you're on concordia's leadership council i'd like to get a sense for you of what you would like to see around the issues that Wellbeing Foundation Africa is on the front lines of, of what you want from different sectors of our community. So let's start with the private sector. What do you want to see the private sector do more? Well, I come to Concordia to find solutions. I come to learn, I come to hear what people are doing and I come to find solutions. The private sector actually sits on a lot of solutions. The best solution the private sector, first of all, has to offer is their supply and chain. Um, efficiency. But I would like the private sector not just to look at the bottom lines and top lines, I would like them to share more. I would like the private sector to exhibit corporate leadership. I was reading a survey the other day that said that people have lost trust in governments, but people still trust corporations. In fact, I think the two most trusted bodies of entities of thought leadership in the world are actually 
corporations and grandmothers. <laughs> and I found that correlation quite um, funny, actually. But I would like the private sector to open up on the solutions that they've got. And I would like them to be doing their business, but sharing their innovation more openly so that those of us in the civil society, in the philanthropies, in government can begin to actually see in detail what they have to offer so that we can partner more innovatively. What would you like to see from the multilateral community? You're very active in a number of them. What, what do you think you want? What do you want to see from them going forward? My biggest ask of the multilaterals is to actually to consider supporting local frontline organizations. When I started my foundation, there was no funding available. So I, I funded it myself. And right from the word go, I said, I want to be able to compete with the multilaterals, but I also want to be a platform that can help other local organizations to apply their solutions and grow. You know, a lot of um, the solutions to the challenges we face, some of them fail because they're not contextualized. And when you really work closely with the local organizations, they give you the value of context that helps you manage your risk, helps you tailor your program design to actually win. So I would like the multilaterals to consider removing the barriers that stop the smaller organizations from accessing the sort of resources needed to go to scope and to scale. And some organizations actually do that quite effectively by, for instance, appointing another global organization, the secretariats in country, in countries like Nigeria, and then the smaller local organizations can get grants through that secretariat organization and also get support. You know, a lot of the local organizations find it very difficult to get grants, not because they can't write the application, but because they don't have the skills to do the accountability reporting that is necessary, you know, for global givers to actually give. So I would like to see the multilaterals open their doors a bit more to the local organizations and build the capacity of the local organizations to partner. What do you want to see from the broader non-profit, non-governmental organization community? The broader non-profit, it's collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think we actually do quite a good job of collaborating. Just yesterday, we announced a commitment with Foundation Botna and some of the other big organizations all put towards um, primary health and primary education. Similarly, we're looking more deeply at education. So that openness and respect I think that if you come from an LMIC or the Global South, we should still be respected, we should respect ourselves, and we should know that the value that we are both bringing to the table, you know, it's not a value that I will put in financial terms, but it's an essential value for program design. So what I would like to see is um, open source respect. And lastly, government. <laughs> from government. <laughs> Where do we begin? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, government is one of the pillars of democracy. What I would like to see from government, we all say an enabling environment, but I think I really do mean that when I say an enabling environment. Government needs to know when to allow CSOs and the private sector, who normally take the innovative risk, they need to know when to take the risk. They need to know when to ask us what we're doing and what is working and what do we think that they can take over and replicate. Because for any of us that starts programming, the real zeal and the real aim actually is to go to scale. And you can't really go to scale across an entire country. My country has 216 million people without some sort of engagement with government. But government needs to operate a higher regulatory environment so that they can remove the suspicion you know, we should all be able to come freely to the table. The laws should be very clear. Yes, we all operate with transparent reporting. But for instance, I don't like the idea that government wants to control every grant that an independent NGO or an independent CSO might be receiving. The truth of the matter is that those of us in that space, we tend to be working where government has failed. So what government should be doing is asking us the knowledge that we have picked up and how did we get this right and how can they take this to scale and open up the way that we can work with their ministries. Now in Nigeria, we work very closely with the Federal Ministry of Health and the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency because over the years we have built trust 
we've built autonomy so they know that we are truly partnering with them. But I do wonder how many other organizations would be in that position. And I see smaller organizations doing great work all the time, but the doors aren't necessarily open. So what I would say from government is, I would like to see an increase in trust, and I would like to see transparent reporting channels, mm -hmm. so that we are just reporting all the time, standard yearly audit, and then we're left to do our jobs. <laughs> Talk a little bit about Concordia. You're on the Leadership Council. One of the roles of the Leadership Council is to guide the institution through a series of decisions, our, our programming, our themes, uh, the issues and institutions and causes that we uh, amplify and, and use Concordia's platform for. You recently coached us and mentored us through uh, a very big decision at Concordia recently. Well, first of all, Matthew, I have to thank you and Nick and the entire Leadership Council and the board for this incredible convergence that is Concordia. Concordia is a place where you can come and you can be sitting with somebody from the rainforest who's come to talk about how they whittle sticks or the next person next to you is a president or a former president of a country. And it's a very open space where people bring their knowledge and they already have that willingness to share that knowledge so that others may learn and grow. And it's absolutely unique. So I find, for instance, my position on the Leadership Council, I was really honored and privileged to join the Leadership Council. I think I was the first African woman, actually, to join the council and I was accepted. You know, there was no gender bias. There was no, oh, you haven't been a former president of a country. I was accepted as an equal member of the council and my opinion counted. And I think as you have seen, you know, we are working at, you know, as you know, I work very closely with the WHO also. We're working towards a tobacco free world, but you know, in less than 24 hours, a policy was empathetically initiated by yourself at Concordia towards the tobacco free world, which I also hope will bring corporates to that same table on how they can do their business better for the well-being of our people and our planet. So Concordia continues to show leadership. The Leadership Council isn't just a leadership council. It's a gathering of brains, ethics, principles, and practices that are always openly shared. It's a table where everybody discusses, even when we disagree, and we come to a concord, actually, we come to consensus. And I believe that consensus is for the greater good. So I really value the innovation that takes place at Concordia. I value the ideas that come out of Concordia that are very quickly and rapidly actualized into actions. And it's, um, it's a must visit and a must participate for me. I come to the UN to speak at the General Assembly and then I do my work sessions, but I would never leave without spending at least a day or two at Concordia. Well, Mrs. Siraki, thank you very, very much for your time today and, and for joining the Swift Hour. Thank you very much, Matthew.